Hello, everybody, and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we, last week, before we left, we were uh, making some changes to how the movement code in the game worked, and in general, uh, we were just starting sort of a sweep towards building out a playable game scenario. Uh, so that we could start to tune our lighting algorithms, our camera, uh, and start to get the art flowing and stuff like that. Just trying to build a working uh, example of how everything in the game should go because we're mostly there in terms of game engine stuff. We've built everything under the sun uh, that you might need. And so now is really the time to just start finishing things uh, to a specific state based on the game. Uh, because most of the stuff that we're going to want to do from here on out will probably be dependent on what the game needs specifically. And so most of the things that we know it needs generically are accounted for. There's stuff in place for whatever those things are, generally speaking. So <clears throat> uh, we don't have any particular uh, sort of schedule or guide for what we are doing there. Uh, it's really just freeform. Uh, as we sort of uh, work on building things out, we build them out, uh, and off we go. Uh, so as you can see here, we've sort of got the, the hopping stuff that I changed from the other day uh, in place. And one of the things that obviously we have a problem with at the moment um, is the fact that we uh, don't have the real art in there yet. Uh, and so that's one of the problems that we probably need to address pretty soon, uh, especially because stuff like the way the hero is assembled, right? It's just kind of three random sprites we stuck on top of each other here. Uh, and they're not drawn at the right perspective from what we want. And I do have art from the right perspective uh, and stuff like that. So there's a couple of things that we can be doing there if we want to start moving towards getting the art in. That's a big one. Uh, but before we quite get there, I want to look at a few other things which is uh, getting the camera and the world sort of construction stuff uh, sort of buttoned up. Because right now we've got a lot of weird stuff that we just have to kind of finalize that's only half in there. Uh, we do have camera stuff, like for example, if I come over uh, towards a, um, uh, uh, a, a look, what am I looking, what's what I'm looking for? A over, overhang, right? Uh, like this one here and we wait, you know, the camera does go and look down to further floors. In fact, I can uh, show that a little bit more effectively if I actually kind of uh, come up some stairs, although I don't know if we have any here. Yeah, we don't have any here. Um, so we do have some stuff in there for the camera, but we changed the way that we were doing rooms and stuff. And so the stuff that was meant to like move from room to room with the camera isn't correct. And more importantly, the zooming, like uh, the way that the camera determines how far out it should be um, when it's like looking at a particular room or things like that, none of that stuff has really been done. And a lot of the reason for it, if I remember correctly, uh, is that we need to start having the notion of what is a room because when the world generation system generates uh, a section of playable region for the game, it's going to have to say specifically what that is, right? Because only the world generation code knows what it wanted the like sort of visible region for a given set of playable stuff to be. Uh, like what a room is, is up to that system, right? So like if the game... Uh, decides to generate like a long skinny room that connects two things only it knows whether the idea behind that when it created it was for you to see a small section of the long skinny room and scroll along with it uh, or whether the idea there was to have it be one large view where it just zooms out and shows you a long skinny room that you hop from one end to the other of right um, and what we would like to do, ideally, is make it so that whatever we are generating for those purposes, that generation can just tell the camera system at the time when it slaps that room down uh, that here's what it wants to do. So that's what we're talking about here, right? Um, and furthermore, we kind of have some other stuff that we'd like to do. Uh, you can see here, like if I zoom out in debug mode, you can see that the camera system still sort of it does nominal work. Um, you can see the white areas are areas that are outside of the viewing, right? If I come in here, we're kind of doing, this is the part it thinks it's supposed to be doing. It's what gets lit. These are parts are not. Um, and that was just some approximate stuff we slapped in there, but you can see that still sort of gives you that uh, impression. 
Um, so you can see the camera still sort of nominally works, but it doesn't really work because this was clearly a room. And so what we want to do is light that whole room. And furthermore, in addition to lighting that room, uh, we want to make sure that that room gets zoomed uh, and looked at for the camera, right? And stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, all of this stuff, again, pretty obvious stuff. It's just now is the time to start doing it uh, because we've got everything else in place and we have to start finalizing things. Uh, now here is an example of two rooms stacked on top of each other like I was looking at before um, or talking about before rather. Uh, so if I bring the, the little dube down here um, and I hop up the makeshift stairway that we built, uh, this is the thing I was talking about before. You can see that the camera is still doing the look down part. So if you want to look down below you to see what's happening, right, the camera still does that stuff. So the camera, we still do have camera control stuff in there uh, and it does work. It's just, it has to now actually get wired up in some intelligent way that makes sense. Uh, and we definitely don't have that at the moment, right? We just, we don't have any conceptualization of that. Um, so the other thing that we're going to have to think about too uh, is, you know, when you want to look at a map, we want to make sure that you can, you know, uh, we, we, want to, we want to be able to see uh, some kind of a logical map that you can look at to understand where you are in the game. Uh, and so that's another strong uh, impetus for having a notion of a room uh, stored in the system somewhere uh, that's sort of metadata that sits on top of the information uh, about the actual entities, right? Like all of these entities here uh, are obviously stored in the game and, and all that. Um, but, you know, they don't really, uh, they don't have any information about their real structure. They don't have any information about like what constitutes um, a region of play, right? And so another region, reason to have that region of play information in there, in addition to guiding the camera uh, and other important aspects of, of the game, is the fact that we need some way of displaying a map and without a notion of what a logical room is, uh, it's gonna be hard to present that information to the player because the player needs to know the connectivity of the rooms in the game. And without that, we would have to write like some kind of AI to try to determine what a good way was to simplify a giant collection of entities down into something that is easy to read at a glance. So again, rather than go that route and have to struggle with it and oftentimes probably have it be wrong or not what a human would uh, do, what we want to do instead again is create that metadata while we're creating the entities so that it's already in there when it goes time to draw the map it just knows what was supposed to be a room and what wasn't so that's what we want to do so i'm just gonna go ahead and jump right in on that task because i feel like we want that either way let's lo load up for a coder here uh, and get our project going um, i'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the uh, world system uh, and the world mode uh, to sort of take a look at how I might want to do this. Now, the interesting thing about this, right, we've got this sort of world information here. And the way that the world information works is it has a, for lack of a better term, it has a giant, like, uh, world database almost that you stuff stuff into and pull stuff out of based on location. So there's a three-dimensional hash table. Well, it's not... The hash table isn't three dimensional. It's a one dimensional hash table, like all hash tables. But the hash key is uh, one dimensional, a uh, three dimensional rather, uh, that we smack down into something that can be used as a as a hash. So the question is, how would we want to put metadata on top of this, right? Because one of the problems that we would have if we tried to make world data be uh, the room data be stored along with the rest of the data is that the queries wouldn't make sense, right? So, for example, one of the things that we would want to do, let's say to draw the map, is we'd want to say, show me all of the rooms that are in this rectangular region. But we're completely unable to answer that question here without going through all of the chunks, right? And pulling out all of the entities. Um, from the hash table sequentially, right? And that's not what we want to do. So 
what what I guess I'm arguing for here is that we probably want some special structure for the metadata uh, that is separate from, not uh, merged with the entity data. Because the entity data is very specific, it's fine grained, we know we only pull tiny regions at a time and we really don't wanna change that, that's good. Uh, but this room data is a different beast, right? It's, it's something that wants to be stored very differently, I think. Um, and so what we want to do is really have a, a secondary structure for that. Now, I'm not going to start out presupposing that I know how I want to store that. I will probably just start out storing that fairly linearly. And then as we go, I will add more abilities to store it in flexible fashion, I suspect. Um, so we'll see. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is, again, just augment the structure. I'm going to say, okay, let's say that we have a world room. Uh, and world room doesn't necessarily mean room in the traditional sense, like not semantic room in the sense that it's got to be a thing with four walls and a roof and a floor. Uh, but I mean room as in a playable region of the game. So this might be outdoors. Uh, it might be, you know, something that bears no resemblance to a literal room, uh, but it is a room in the gameplay sense of the term room. So it might be a forest, like Legend of Zelda had a lot of rooms that were a forest area, right? But they still obey the traditional notion of a room. There's one screen uh, and you know you did stuff on it and left. So uh, if we take this world room, what do I want to know about this room? Well, I think the basic things that I really want to know here uh, is I want to know uh, some of the camera stuff that we were talking about before. We had put that into the game entity system. So if you remember the entities had ways of describing themselves as uh, camera information, right? So you can see here, uh, there's a bunch of, of information uh, about how the camera should behave. You can see here, like we've got all this camera behavior stuff. Uh, and this was things that sort of said, hey, uh, here's some information we wanna tell you about the camera um, for a, a given area inside uh, the room. And this again was for markups, like if I stand here, I wanna zoom in or something like that, right? Things like that. And so I don't think we really need most of that uh, stuff here. I think all we really need is some more basic stuff like the bounds, right? So like, for example, I can take this world position here uh, and just say, okay, let's just make a three-dimensional boundary. So a right rectangular prism, like we talk about many times, um, which is basically just a three-dimensional rectangle. Let's describe a three-dimensional rectangle that is meant to contain the entire room, okay? Uh, and then from there, um, what we'll say is when we have this entire room, defined, we then want to know roughly how you expect it to be viewed, okay? So we need some hint, essentially, that the system, uh, that, that the, the game is going to give uh, to the camera system that says, I want the whole room viewed, I want this much of the room viewed, uh, you know, whatever, right? Uh, and so I think, I mean, the, the, I guess the most straightforward way to implement that is just to say what the camera offset is supposed to be, probably, although not really. So, because if you think about it, let me draw this really quickly, because there's a reason why I think talking about the camera offset is maybe not such a useful thing to do. Uh, in this case, so I'm gonna bring up Milton here. So the camera behavior per room uh, wants to say stuff like I was sort of uh, alluding to before, where let's suppose I have a long hallway like this, and the player is here, 
you know, and they're hopping uh, down the hallway. What I want to say is, okay, did you want to view that sort of this way, where the camera is seeing the whole thing, or did you want to view it more like this and have it scroll upward, right? Um, and those are the two things that I would think you might logically want to do. There aren't a whole lot of ways the camera could shoot this, you know, um, that seems like pretty much most of it. So you kind of need two versions. There's uh, a room-centric version, I guess you might say, uh, and a player-centric version. Um, and so what I suspect we would need, unless there's some other... Uh, you know, and I, and I really can't think of it. Um, unless there's something else to be said here, I think we kind of just can make those be... So, you know, as I'm, as I'm saying this out loud too, I guess I'm wondering maybe this doesn't even need to be in the room structure. Because those things could still be done quite easily by just where the player is standing. There's a lot of complexity here, not really in terms of code, because the code is not that hard. The complexity in my head really is about just what the game wants to do. Uh, and uh, again, part of the problem there is I'm not a game designer, so this is not my area of expertise, um, as I say oftentimes. So, you know, if we had a clear mandate from the designer, if there was one, about what should happen here, then we'd just go write that thing. Uh, but thinking through what's going to happen here, there's a couple of different things. So one thing that is worth noting is that scrolling, um, you know, let's say, what if we do have a co-op mode in this game? Because, you know, like I was showing the other day, we, even from the very beginning of the game, right, um, here's, you know, one hero, but if you just uh, push the start button on like a Xbox controller, you get another hero, you know. Um, and off you go. So the question that I have there is just, um, if you were playing co-op, then it kind of makes sense what you would do if you both, you, you know, maybe you both stand on this square and then it leaves the room or something, or I don't know, you both hop out. Uh, and then, I, like, I don't really know, to be honest with you, exactly how you move from room to room when you're co-op. Uh, it's, it's a bit confusing. Uh, I, I mean, maybe one player is just marked as the key player and that player can leave the room or not. And the other player is, is confined to the bounds of the room till they do. Uh, you know, I don't really know. Uh, it's tough to say, but there's a lot of ways we could handle that. Let's put it that way. But one of the things that we need to determine is if you were to support some co-op play, which, you know, I'll be honest, is kind of nice. Um, I said we wouldn't do networking, but we could easily do uh, co-op play, right? It's just a question of whether we want to take the time to be able to generate co-op worlds, because they're different, obviously, uh, than single player worlds. So if we ever decide to generate co-op worlds, then we definitely have this other consideration to make, which is that the camera can't zoom on a player. It has to zoom on both players, right? Um, but I, you know, again, the reason I'm talking this out is just to get it straight in my head. Like I said, if we had a mandate from the designer, we'd be fine. Let's just say we do that. I still think we have these two concerns. Um, and so what that kind of suggests to me is like, maybe this stuff is not, uh, as relevant. I mean, maybe it is because you, both of you can stand somewhere and then it would do this, but you know, as you might imagine, it's really just not that interesting to talk about specific things that happen when you're at particular locations in a room. If you're in co-op mode, you're never going to be at a specific location in a room. You're at two specific locations in a room, right? And that to me just kind of argues for something that's going to be more generic. It's like we either are in a room where we show the whole room or we're in a room where we show uh, two 
uh, characters who are focused on you know, your two two characters are focused together kind of a thing right So I don't know. I mean, that's all I really have to say about that. I wish I had some more uh, specific opinion about how that should work, but I don't really know that I do. Uh, and so, you know, if I was just gonna type in the sort of most basic version of that, Probably be something like this. Right? Um, and, you know, maybe we just eventually get rid of this. Uh, I wish I had a, a more sort of uh, I wish I wish I had a more coherent view of what should happen there, but I just really don't. Um, so I'm just gonna say that that's what that is. Uh, and we're gonna go from there. Uh, so, my mouse is currently stuck beneath my drawing tablet. Uh, so if I take a look here and I just say, all right, so a world room uh, has bounds and a camera. Uh, and then I just, uh, again, this is, If I go ahead and just say we've got some big set of these in here, uh, that's all the rooms in the game. Uh, I don't know how many rooms there are going to be, but let's just say we've got a lot of them. Um, uh, some really giant number. Maybe that's a little bit too many. Let's say a little bit less than that. I don't know. Um, so if I just say that I've got some big old thing that just says how many rooms in the game there, how many rooms there are in the game, and there's just that many rooms, um, and I go ahead and have a room count in here, I can just spam rooms into this, and then maybe I can draw those rooms, right? So when you go to the map, we draw the rooms that there are in the game, and, you know, everyone's happy, and it's great, and whatever. Um, <clears throat> so let's just do that, because we have an easy way to get started down that path. What you can see right now is when I do this, you can see that we've got a region that we pull entities out in, but I can't see anything else, right? So these test rooms that we slap down here, you know, they're there, um, and I can go from one to the other. And when I do go from one to the other, right, you can kind of see we scroll through the world as we should um, and all that nonsense, but uh, I can't see what actually got generated. You know what I mean? Uh, I can't actually see the rest of the world because uh, those entities are all packed into the world thing and I don't know, like, I have no idea what other parts of the world there might be. So even just for our own, like, edification, debugging-wise, it'd be nice to be able to see a map at this point so we know what the heck we generated, right? Um, so I do want to kind of go ahead and get that going as well, so I think this might be a good opportunity for us to do that. I'm going to go ahead and hop up here just because now I'm obsessed with hopping around. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, sorry, this is one of the problems when you actually have a 
fun movement thing to do is you end up doing it all the time. Um, what can you say? So I think I've reached the end of the world, I think. Yeah. Um, so without traversing the whole world like that, we would have no idea what the world actually was because even we don't have the ability to draw a map right now, so that's kind of a bad thing. So one of the things I can do just to start off with to get this uh, system rolling a little bit and to start to play with it and see what I actually want to do here uh, is to just dump all the rooms that we created into this room structure so that I can actually draw them and see what they look like. So that's my first thing that I would like to do when I go uh, into the uh, world mode uh, add room nonsense, right? We have this add standard room thing here uh, and the standard room comes back and all that. Um, and so what I could do is inside the uh, um, code that adds this stuff here, I should be able to do something uh, where I place the world's information into one of these as well, right? So when I do add standard room here and it puts the room in there, maybe I just do it right in here for now. Uh, so we come through here and we've got sort of a, an idea of where everything is. Um, maybe in here I go ahead and set up, you know, you can see here like us setting up some of these uh, ca uh, cameras and stuff like that. Uh, maybe what I wanna do here, just say, all right, let's go ahead and put a, I don't even know what this, oh, this is just, Oh, this is the whole room right here. Yeah. Uh, so this is the room information right here, actually, right? You can see it. So we actually have all this stuff recorded. It's just not in where we want it to be recorded, right? Here's brain type room, right? Um, so again, we have all this information, like we were already doing it, like I was saying before. Uh, we just weren't storing it in a way that we can pull out uh, in any convenient way, right? I don't actually know if we uh, do anything So you can see here, right, this is the way we were pulling it out. So once in a while we would use it, we would see whether or not we had a room piece of information, and then we would look to see what the camera behavior was supposed to be in that room, right? Uh, so we had the ability to do exactly what I'm saying, but not in any, we didn't have the ability to talk about uh, those things separately so that we could do stuff like draw a map or anything like that, right? Uh, and so we, I think, like I said, we do want to be able to do that. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing now. Anyway, uh, the, the, the only question that I have, right, is just whether this, because we already have a system that can do this based on locations more specifically, um, the question is just, do we want, uh, do we want this data to still be handled on a regional basis? Or do we want to just like lean on the room concept and say, look, everything's got to go through the room concept because especially with two players at a time, you're going to have to deal with that, right? All right. So uh, in update camera for entity movements, the only person who uses that thing anyway, and we can leave that in place. But now when we have this information here, the, uh, uh, the simple grounded collision stuff, this information is exactly the information we need in order to specify um, the rest of the world information. So if I wanna say that we have a world room here, uh, I should be able to tell it that. Uh, and maybe this has to take uh, that all that information. So I'll just say that it's a focus on room world for now, uh, room for now. Uh, but I need to do, know the minimum position and uh, the maximum position. Uh, and so what I think I have to do is I think I have to do this stuff here uh, where we do make the sim simple grounded collision stuff. I need to do this effectively um, with the chunk position stuff, right? So in order to figure out where that's going to be, I need to do a, a chunk position from, uh, from tile position. And that'll give me, I believe that gives me a world position uh, a piece of world position that I need. Let me just verify that. Yeah. Um, so once I have one of these, I just need, um, I just need some way 
uh, to, to pass these down, but I know what they are, right? Because I know that the minimum, like I, I created all the entities in here, you know? So I know that my offset was negative radius y, negative radius x to positive radius x, positive radius y. So I know where exactly I was. Uh, uh. Right. Uh, and so I know where I was. The only question is, what's the Z range? Uh, and I don't actually know what that is uh, because the current way that we do it is not right. So you can see we do typical floor height here and that's just because we hard coded that for the room. Um, but we don't actually know that that's gonna hold for certain in the case of this, uh, you know, going forwards. So in reality, we should have a value here that's like, how tall is the room? Um, and in lieu of not knowing how tall the room is, we would need something else here, right? For now, I can just do something like this and we'll just adjust this manually to figure out what we want it to actually be. Uh, but otherwise it should be fine. Now, one of the problems that we have with chunk uh, position from tile position is it's gonna give us not quite the whole room area. That might be fine. I'm not sure how we wanna do that exactly. Uh, we'll take a look at that later, but point being, it'll go from centers of tiles, which is maybe what we wanna talk about for the room, maybe not what we wanna talk about for the room. It depends on how we wanna talk about rooms, whether they have to be abutting or whether there can be space between them or who knows. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Point being, I'm gonna go over into the world structure itself here, and I'm gonna go ahead and specify what the uh, version of this function should be. Uh, let me get it out from behind my head there. So in here, if I want to add a world room, I just need to, uh, well, you know, it, I mean, it's literally just gonna be recording one of these, right? So it's literally just saying, pass me the parameters uh, that you wanted to fill in for the structure and we'll fill them in. Now, why am I doing it this way? Uh, the reason that I'm doing it this way is uh, because I don't actually want to let the outside people change the min pose and max pose necessarily because I need to potentially insert this into a spatial partition later, right? So what I'm doing here is just saying, hey, you gotta pass me these two in. This one we could leave out. I just added it for convenience. Uh, that one we could leave out, um, but we're not going to for now. So let me go ahead and uh, assert here that we haven't run out of room. And again, like I said, this is only temporary, but I always put the assertions in even if it's only temporary. The reason that I put the assertions in even if it's only temporary is you never know what's really temporary. I mean, a lot of stuff happens in game development. You never have enough time to finish everything. It's always a rush and you're trying to prioritize things. We may get to the end of the game and it's still this hard-coded array, right? Because it just, it didn't, end up being a high enough, uh, prob a big enough problem to, to spend the time on, right? And so that's one of the problems, that's why I say always put the assertion in there, always do the check. Uh, it takes only a fraction of a, of a of, well, a fraction of a second. No, it takes only 10 seconds to put it in there. That way you know if it's uh, starting to cause some weird bug, uh, memory overwrite or something like that, you might as well do it because you never know what's gonna stay in there longer than you anticipated or perhaps all the way until the end of the game. Um, so it's just not a good idea to assume that just because you know something isn't a good way to do something that that won't end up in the game because some of those things will. They just won't end up being enough of a problem um, Oops. Uh, for you to ever deal with them and if you don't have to deal with them, then you don't and uh, that goes out in the product. And you may have a little lurking bug in there uh, that you'll forget about till the very end and then it will come back to bite you and that's never good. Uh, so anyway, here I've, I've gone ahead and I've added a room um, and so now when we actually run the game, it should build up that uh, room array. So we've got a certain number of those there. Uh, we wouldn't know because obviously we're not using that room information. But what I'd like to do now is when, I, when I'm doing this, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and uh, be fatty about it. I'm just gonna go ahead and draw everything. 
uh, that there is, because again, there's no world partition. So I'm just going to loop through them and just draw them. So in the world mode, when we are looping through all of like our uh, sim region stuff uh, and doing the sort of well-behaved things that actually do use spatial partition, after that's done, I am going to go ahead and render all of the rooms in the game, period, right? Uh, so, you know, you can see here we're, we're when we uh, are, uh, where is it? You can see here some stuff that I don't have. Okay. Uh, so you can see here we've got like these uh, volume outlines, for example. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, and turn those back on. Um, what you can see is those volume outlines allow us to draw stuff uh, like just debug information, you know? Uh, and what I would like to do is I'd like to go ahead and draw that debug information uh, for the rooms. This, for example, is just some basic information that we were drawing. Um, I, to be completely honest with you, don't remember what it was or why we were drawing it. Uh, this is the sim region, the region that's getting pulled in uh, and all that nonsense. That's all fine. Uh, I don't care about any of that. I just wanted to have it in there so I could show you what I'm talking about. What I'm going to do is take this volume outline uh, code, which draws things for us, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, use that to draw all the rooms. Uh, now, I don't know whether I need to do that inside Death Peel or not. Uh, I assume that I should just go ahead and do so uh, because we might as well get depth sorting in there. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say that we've got a room index here. The room index runs from uh, zero to whatever the world says the room count is. So however many rooms we've got, uh, that's how many I'm going to draw. So in here, I'm going to push the volume outline. And you can see here is I need a way uh, you know, uh, this is just a hard-coded one here. Uh, I need a way of actually specifying what these should be. Now, the color here and the width are fine, um, but I need this part to make more sense. I've got a rect min-max, and I just don't know what to pass uh, for these two parameters. Now, remember, these are going to be camera relative, uh, and so I'm going to have to use the sim region here uh, to make sense of all that. Um, and in fact, to be honest, this should probably be inside this bracket because I kind of was looking at this bracket as stuff that had to do with the sim region. So let's just go ahead and um, put it in there. So let me grab the room out. Here's the rural room. I'm going to say uh, that array of rooms. Just give me whichever one I'm on. And then I know I've got a min position and a max position. The question is, how do I translate that? And if you remember, this is kind of going back to old handmade hero stuff from the old days, the sim region knows how to interpret uh, coordinates relative to itself. Uh, and I think that's all we really need to, to do here, right? Um, so what I need to do is say, okay, wherever the sim region is, I need a way of mapping something uh, in the sim region. I need a way to map something out. Uh, and so you can see that it, I believe it does this in kind of a compressed way. You can see here it does like a relative thing where it does, all right, here's the entity position plus the volume position. And, you know, it does some, uh, well, actually, uh, it's, it's this stuff here, right? Um, here's it looking to see whether these things collide um, with the region. Where are we doing this? Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Forget everything I just said. Where's my begin? This is what, this is the function I want to be in. Um, so you can see here when we go through this, right? Uh, we've got the, the, uh, the entity itself coming in and we use the location that it is. Um, we use the chunk delta which is the thing that says where this particular world block is relative to uh, the sim region. And so that's the same thing that we want to do. Here's the chunk position X, Y, and Z, right? It's a world position. Uh, and we're calling this subtract. Now that's the thing that we actually want to do here. We want to know the delta from the sim region's uh, origin out to it. And so I want to just make that more systemic because I don't actually think, um, I 
I don't actually think we ever pulled that out because if we did, we would have called it, right? You can kind of see it's just not there. So what I want to do, because now someone's going to be using this outside, is I want to make that a little more systemic. And so this, uh, what I effectively want to do here is say, all right, um, make relative or, or uh, get sim relative position. Uh, I want to be able to do that and you know it's basically going to pass this exact same thing except it's just going to do it like that. So it passes the sim region in and then it'll effectively do uh, this operation. So in here we have um, an equivalent inline uh, that's just going to return Oops. Don't ask me why I just did that. My brain's a little bit fried today. Uh, so if you take a world position um, uh, coming in here, what I'm just going to do is say, OK, perform the exact same thing we were doing to map all of our entities in. Uh, but now you can call it from outside. So if this thing wants to do a rectum in max, now it totally can. All it has to do is just call this thing twice um, on the world's min pose uh, and the world's max pose. Uh, and that should do it. Where is our sim region? World sim. That's what I actually wanted. At least I believe that's what I wanted. Nope. Uh, try that one more time. It's been a long time since I touched this part of the code. There we go. All right. Um, so what you can see here is we've got a little bit of a, of a bugginess to us here. Uh, I'll have to go through. I probably had a typo in there somewhere. We're basically correct, but just not quite. Um, so we're not getting one of our, one of our lengths is wrong. Uh, so I'm guessing that when I added it, um, in the first place, so add standard room. Uh, I'm guessing that that is typoed, and I'm correct. Uh, and so all I really want to do is just fix that and take a look at these rectangles, which now should be correct. Um, so what you can see here, like I was saying, is they run through centers of tiles, which is probably not uh, what we want. Um, but we now have exactly what I was talking about, which is the ability to see where the rooms are. Now, currently we are clipping. So you can see we clip here. Uh, we got near and far clip planes there. Um, and uh, so that's probably something it would be nice to get rid of. Uh, maybe just set these to something a little bit different. We could use an infinite, I don't think we ever talked about infinite far clip plane. Um, we probably should talk about infinite far clip plane at some point, maybe set it to infinite far clip plane. Um, because infinite far clip plane would let us see the whole map. Uh, whereas now, as we zoom out, right, we're gonna fall out of the far clip plane region, right, as we go. Uh, so there's that, but oh well. Anyway, uh, that's all I wanted to accomplish for getting those uh, room barriers in there. And so now once we have those room boundaries in there, uh, we can draw a map if we want to, right? So if we had a map mode, we could just draw the rooms um, and off we would go. Now the question is just, all right, since we have the room information now, um, I guess there's, there's a couple of things we want to do with that, I suppose. Uh, 
And again, I, I guess this gets down to sort of some design decisions about how we want to make this stuff uh, go. So, I think what we want to say, um, I think I think we want to have an idea of which room the player is in at any particular time. Um, and the reason that I say that is just because I think we're going to want to have. Uh, I think we're going to want to have stuff based on this a little bit more, um, well, it's just such a hard decision, right? Because it, it may be that all we want to do is that, like literally what I just did, it might be the entirety of what we want. Because all we're going to use it for is the map, for all I know, right? Um, so maybe we really just don't want to do any more of it yet. We've got a way to put them in there and that's all we really want. Uh, and everything else will just be based on uh, entities that are uh, regional entities because we've got that ability. Maybe that's the smart thing to do, you know? Um, I really don't know. Uh, but that's sort of where we're at. I just, I just don't know the right answer to that question. And so we may need to delay that a little bit further. Let's just push that back a little bit. Let's go get the camera stuff working. Um, for let's let's go make the camera stuff that we have in there currently work better uh, in terms of zooming out and making sure that it captures the entirety of uh, whatever room that you happen to be in at the time because um, at the moment that doesn't work so what we want to do here is is have like uh, those camera modes and and since we have those specified at the moment uh, we could just say, look, let's just make sure that those uh, actually work. Like right now they don't, uh, and we need to have some way of making sure that they do. So if we come through to world creation stuff and take a look at how that's going, um, I'm interested in making a couple different things. What I would like to do is I'd like to make... Um, I'd like to make different types of rooms. One that you roam around that's bigger, um, that scrolls with you, uh, a small one that it zooms in on. Like, like I want to make a couple of these rooms uh, and I want to make them work reasonably. So I'm going to, I, I want to figure out how we're going to start getting the room building working a little bit better. So I'm just going to grab all the code that does this stuff and I'm going to put it into a file that I can isolate and grind on for a little bit, right? Um, so I'm gonna introduce a new file here in the code. I, I'm gonna make something um, that's about world building, right? So maybe this is handmade. Um, something like that. I don't know. Um, one of the nice things about file names is you can, you're always free to change them later. Oops. Um, here we go. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just see uh, what I've got here. Uh, Uh, in terms of code, because this stuff is going to need massive upgrading because we've never done anything real for it, right? It's all kind of just garbage. Um, it's it simply, you know, we've simply spent no time on this. Um, <clears throat> it's just a routine that has been repeatedly just kind of tweaked to do whatever random test stuff we wanted, and we've never done anything... Um, <clears throat> to try and make uh, it functional, it's all messed up and weird, right? So 
this, all this code is garbage. We just know that going into it. It was all just test code that we were using because we needed some stuff to do all of our rendering and asset loading and all the stuff that we built for the engine. And so now what we have to do is actually think about how this stuff should work for real. So I'm just gonna grab out this code um, and, and see what we've got here, right? And you can see we've got sort of a begin world change, end world change kind of idea here. I'm gonna wrap that up into this stuff because it seems like it's relevant. Um, uh, with the understanding that I'm probably gonna wanna get rid of a lot of it. Uh, okay, um, so let me just build this here for starters. Um, and so what we've now done is we've rem we've basically removed the roll code. So if we run the game, it should just like fault out uh, immediately. Uh, and because the um, the initial player, the 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 hero, can't stand anywhere. So when it tries to add a player, it's going to be like there's no world. I I can't. Um, I can't be placed anywhere, right? Um, and so we've completely exercised the world building code. It, it, it will now assert on startup that like it cannot do anything. Uh, it goes to get the location uh, of an entity there and can't do it. Uh, and so uh, off you go, right? So now what I need to do is say, all right, let's start trying to make this stuff uh, let's try to make this stuff a little more systemic so I can actually build a little world in here. Let's start trying to fix the stuff that's busted about it and all that good stuff. Um, so I want to make some uh, understanding here. Uh, just, um, well, I guess before I do that, let me just go ahead and put that stuff in here. There we go. Uh, and this is just gonna be create world. There we go. Uh, and inside world mode, if I just call that, uh, in theory, I should be fine. Uh, so back where we were. Um, in here where we would have done it before, I'm just going to do it uh, here. Uh, and that should do it. Um, the only thing that this currently has uh, in it is this um, one function you can call, uh, but that's fine. So now we should be back to the existing world that we had and we are and that's fine. Um, and so here's the, uh, the basic starting point that we're at. <clears throat> Uh, and so what I want to do is start to try and figure out how we're going to actually build these things. And so I feel like the first thing that I want to do here is actually try to um, I, I, I kind of want to try to make I, I want to be able to talk about stuff without thinking about how it's actually going to happen, right? So I kind of want to just pie in the sky or, or uh, uh, you know, pure whimsy, if you will. I want to just uh, try to make calls that are fictitious. Like I'm imagining, I often say you start with the usage code if you know what the usage code is. In this case, that's kind of what I want to do, right? I want to say, let's pretend we have a system for uh, generating stuff and placing stuff in the world that is whatever we want, right? 
so I don't have to think about what I'm actually doing. I can just pretend to call functions that magically do what I want. And then I'm gonna look at that and see what that implies for the API that should be in place for building the world. Because if you magically dream of an API that does everything you want, well, that's a pretty good spec for the ideal API, right? And then you can deal with the realities of it later by going, okay, now what do I need to change to make this actually achievable? And usually that change isn't that big. On the other hand, if you start by building a system for building worlds, and then later you try to write to it using the API that came out of that, you may be very misinformed because you haven't actually thought about what you actually are going to do in practice, which tends to be subtly or significantly different from what you imagine the API should have been if you're only looking at it from the perspective of this system itself. <clears throat> so, uh, let's start out with the basics here. Um, the idea I'm literally just going to start um, with the most uh, straightforward stuff. Uh, I'm literally going to start just at the beginning and and go from there. Uh, so I don't even know if I want to do it this way, but obviously this game uh, starts at the orphanage uh, for the the home for limbless children where all the limbless children are and so I want to create a little orphanage layout uh, and the orphanage layout uh, should be something that's like got the handmade heroes room where the handmade hit where where the handmade hero lives and then also rooms for all the other characters uh, and there's a lot of other characters in the game um, who are little NPCs or whatever that you can uh, rescue and stuff like that. So the, the orphanage should be sort of a little hub area. And then we need a way to get out of the orphanage. And getting out of the orphanage uh, would involve um, walking out the door in, and into a path uh, for the forest. And then going out the path to the forest should get you into the actual adventuring uh, area of the game or whatever. So I'm literally just gonna start by trying to do something like that. Um, and I don't know how I want it to happen, but I'm just gonna start typing things in. Um, so I need to, you know, uh, I don't know, I need to do something like this, where I say, look, I need to create a room here. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna differentiate, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to differentiate between world rooms, which are rooms that have actually been created, and generation rooms. And the reason that I want to differentiate between these is, is fairly straightforward. This is putting the cart before the horse a little bit, but it's just because I know how these sorts of things go. I've done lots of generative coding before. So one of the things that you don't want to do when you're making a generative system is actually make anything before you know what everything is that you're going to make. And that sounds a little bit weird, but let me just try to, well, you know what, let me just draw it for you. Um, I find a diagram always helps because, you know, we are visual thinkers at the end of the day uh, and it helps. Um, so a room in the case of Handmade Hero implies a bunch of stuff. There's like, you know, the bounds and the entities uh, and where they are uh you know and what they are right there's all this information about what a room is in handmade hero so when i go to make a room for the orphanage or a room for a dungeon or whatever in order to actually create the real room that's in the game i need to know all of that information but some of that information may be dependent on things i don't know yet for example, if I need to create some rooms that connect to each other, I may not know what the room is that this room connects to because I have to create one of the rooms first, right? And so I may want to do some things that analyze the fact that two rooms are connected first before actually making either room because maybe it will determine where those rooms are placed and until I know where those rooms are placed, I can't make them. So rather than placing down a room and saying, okay, I'm making this room, 
uh, this is room A, and then I'm going to make room B, and room B goes here. What I'd rather do is create sort of the idea that there is a room A, and the idea that there is a room B, say that they're connected, and then later on I will generate from that the actual physical room A and B. This directly models what happens in, say, a compiler, right? A compiler doesn't often read uh, the exact line of code that you wrote and output some assembly exactly right away, right? Usually what happens is it goes through an intermediate, right? This is basically the IR, the intermediate representation for our world gen. And IRs are very important because what they let you do is they let you work with something semantically first before actually creating the concrete version of it that you're going to use and this allows for more facile flexibility. For example, I can create a bunch of these things that are related to each other, have hypothetical locations about where they might be, shift them around, run a solver on them to figure out where they should be placed, right? Um, all of those things I might want to do, I don't want to move all their entities around. I don't want to even have created the entities that are in them. I just want to know what entities probably will be in them and go from there, figure out where they go, and then once I know everything else about it, then stamp the room down, right? So I want to make a, a notion of a generated room but that is not the same as a handmade hero room because it's sort of existing in this in, uh, imaginary uh, abstract space. I could call it an abstract room or something like that, but I feel like gen room is good because it says it's in the gen system. That's kind of what I want to say about it. <clears throat> I want to be able to say, look, let's generate all these rooms and then say how they're connected up and then start placing them down and, and maybe make something happen. I don't know. We'll see. Could be dumb, could not be dumb. We'll find out later. It doesn't really matter right now. Um, so let's say we've got the hero's uh, bedroom here. This may not be a very accurate uh, way that an orphanage would be constructed because an orphanage is probably trying to maximize the number of people they can keep uh, in a particular space because they're trying to, you know, accept as many children as they can. But this is going to be a very posh orphanage maybe, you know. Um, this, is, uh, th this, is, this is the... Uh, um, uh, the, the Trump orphanage, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an orphanage for luxury orphans. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and it just, it has like gold plated stuff in it or whatever, for some reason. Uh, really that reason is just gameplay. I want there to be enough room for you to hop around. But point being, um, this is, this is probably not representative of a real orphanage in any particular way because all of a sudden people have individual rooms or something like that, which doesn't seem plausible to me, but that's okay. It's not very plausible that there are that many, um, children hopping around with no limbs going on adventures in a forest anyway, so we're kind of in the realm of the absurd even when we just start walking down this path to begin with. Um, so anyway, I want to do, be able to generate rooms here, uh, and I want to be able to generate, uh, rooms for, uh, different uh for 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 different orphans as well as like you know a central room and then i want that path and so on i also wanted a garden um there's a gardener uh one, one of the in fact there's there's sort of a, a rough sketch that anna did a, a while back um where you can actually see these and i have the art for these uh, all of these characters too um uh on mollyrocket.com there is a, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so the, there's a, a gardener orphan who um, does gardening. And uh, basically what happens there is at first there's no garden, but when you recover a gardening glove for the gardening orphan, she can then go garden in the garden and, and grow stuff, right? Um, and most of these uh, orphans have stuff like that. Like this is a tailor and the tailor can, and, the, and a cook, you know. Um, so there's a number of orphans and they have different uh, things that they can do. And so in the um, fiction here, I want a couple different things uh, as well as rooms. So there's like your bedroom um, and then there's the uh, tailor room. I don't know what you call the room in which a, a fabric designer or a tailor works. Uh, so I guess I'll just call it Taylor Room because I have no uh, better way of, of stating it. Um, uh, and maybe I'll just have a couple more bedrooms here. 
right? Because uh, there's a lot of, uh, of, of folks in here. Um, so we'll just have some rooms randomly, some bedrooms and whatever, uh, and then some additional stuff here. Uh, I want to have so, sort of a, um, a, that forest path, right? Uh, and then I want to have like the forest entrance or something. And so that's a pretty good example. Like if we can make this work, we can probably make most things work, right? I mean, there's a little bit, one of the things this doesn't have is a graph cycle in it. Uh, and so we might want to try and figure out how to make a graph cycle. Um, and again, let me, let me sort of say what I mean by that. So if you take a look at what happens, um, So let's see that our orphanage looks like this. Oops. Uh, so here's the forest entrance. Here's the path. Here's the garden. Here's some of the bedrooms. Hero bedroom, whatever. Suppose it looks basically like this. Well, what you'll notice here is that there are no cycles in this graph. If you imagine each room is the node of a graph, um, and each of the connections between the rooms is an edge in the graph, then if you were to draw the corresponding graph, it would just look like this. I guess I should put M there for main room. Right, that's the graph. And what you can see here is anywhere that you start on the graph, if you do not retread one of your edges, so if I, if I only allow myself to walk along this graph on edges I have not already walked on, I can never get back to where I started, right? If I start on E, no matter how I traverse this graph, I can never get back to E. It's not possible. I would have to retrace a path in the opposite direction in order to get back to E, right? But let's suppose there was a secret exit here. <clears throat> and that secret exit went to a path that led to the forest entrance as well. Now I don't know why there would be such a thing, but let's just say that there was. Then the graph looks like this. And now that is no longer true. There is now a cycle. And the cycle is that we come through here and I could start at E and return to E without ever retracing my path, right? Um, so we may want to artificially introduce something like that uh, simply because it helps guarantee that our graph system handles anything it might need to handle. Cycles are the most complicated thing that will happen in a graph um, because, well, graphs just aren't that complicated. But to say the least, um, a graph that has no cycles in it is simpler than a graph that does have cycles in it. Uh, and I would like to make sure that we're starting with something uh, that has the most complicated case. So as I work through it, uh, I know I'm not missing something. Okay. So let's just do exactly what I said. Uh, maybe there's a, a secret path back here like that or something so maybe there's a back door right uh, and so maybe those things connect to each other right um, and so what I want to do now is I want to have uh, some way of saying that these things do exactly the stuff uh, that I said they would do before. So if I just go by this and say this is roughly how I want it to behave, what I could say is like, all right, I would like these things to connect uh, in a specific pattern, right? So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, um, the, the main room uh, connects to the hero bedroom. In fact, the main room connects to like all these things, right? So the, you know, the, 
the, the main room needs to connect out to the hero's bedroom, the ABCD bedrooms, um, the tailor room, <coughs> uh, the kitchen, uh, so that's all the stuff in the main one. Then it's got its exterior entrances. Uh, so that's the forest path uh, and the back door path, right? Um, and then from then on, I want to say like, okay, I've got uh, the things on the outside. They connect in a specific way as well. So I've got the forest path. Um, connecting to the garden, oops, uh, and connecting to the forest entrance. Um, I've got the back door path connecting to the side alley. Um, and then I've got uh, the side alley connecting to the forest entrance, right? Um, and again, as you, as we start to try and make this stuff work, you'll see why cycles are more difficult because as you lay things out, they become more problematic, certainly. Uh, but that's basically what I want to do, right? Um, and so now what we need to do is specify some more information about what these things are supposed to have in them, right? In terms of some kind of like generation parameters, right? They need some stuff. Uh, and that stuff needs to, to be specified in a way that allows uh, of some future th hypothetical piece of code that generates things um, to be able to know what to fill these rooms with or what they should look like, how they should be shaped, all that kind of stuff, right? So what I want to do now is introduce a concept of like a room spec or something. Uh, and the room spec should say how this stuff should be generated, right? Uh, and so, you know, like maybe there's just a generic forest spec. Uh, and again, I don't know uh, exactly what that would entail here or anything like that. Um, probably want it more like that. Um, Or maybe, you know what, maybe it's just like this. Uh, and so what I need to do here is tell these things when I make the rooms, I need to tell them, here's what you want to use to generate yourself. So, you know, in this case, I've got a basic forest, basic forest, Maybe these are all basic forests for now. And we'll tweak them a little later. Um, so all of this stuff is basic forest. Uh, So maybe something like this, where we can just say, all right, um, we've got a few room specs here and these can, those can be used uh, to generate whatever these rooms have to be. Um, and they're basically prescriptions about what sorts of stuff is allowed in the room and what sorts of stuff isn't allowed in the room, right? Uh, so I think that's all of it, right? <laughs> Bedroom, main room, tailor, kitchen, garden, done. Uh, so again, just kind of laying this out the way that I would imagine wanting to do it. Um, Uh, this is probably going to be something like this. Uh, 
and that all seems fine. So when I generate one of these specifications, um, I'm gonna need a bunch of information uh, about how they work. At the moment, I don't know that there's much I wanna say about them because we probably can get into that a little bit later, uh, but you can imagine the sorts of things that we might want to have here. They're gonna be stuff like saying, hey, this is, you know, the type of stuff that can be on the ground. And this is the type of stuff that can be on the walls. And this, you know what I mean? Uh, so at starters, we won't specify anything and they'll just be generic rooms that have no character to the mode whatsoever. But eventually these specs will have to get uh, information in them and that's how it knows what to create. Now, all of these things are gonna have to take some kind of a generator, right? Uh, and that's just basically a parameter where it's like, hey, where does the memory come from? And what, where are we storing all this information? And how am I connecting it to other things in the world that might be relevant and blah, 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 right? So looking at the API here, we can sort of start to see exactly what, uh, what needs to happen, I think. Um, and uh, honestly, I think that's mostly it. Uh, I guess if I'm being specific here, let's just suppose I went the whole nine. So if we take a look at what I'm talking about here, I'm just saying, all right, uh, we've got an orphanage creation routine, it specifies all the stuff that's relevant to the orphanage. Now, as you might imagine, the game can't just be an orphanage, uh, but that's okay because when we do this, what we can do is when we pass this back, right? Uh, we can just say that there's like a gen orphanage struct and the gen orphanage struct has the outgoing connections, right? So the room uh, that's the forest entrance is the only thing that this thing actually allows you to work with. Although we may also want to do the hero bedroom because that's where the player should get placed. So what we can say is when you call create orphanage, you get at, you know back from that, uh, you get the information you would need to connect it up if you wanted to. And you're going to want to, right? Because you're going to need to connect it up to stuff later. Um, so we can say it's like, okay, uh, the hero bedroom gets recorded, uh, the forest entrance gets recorded, nothing else really needs to, but we, could, we can return anything we want here. So when you create one of these uh, with a, you know, world generator, uh, you get back the information that you needed about what was in, you know, how you might plug into this thing uh, that you made. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Hopefully uh, you understand what I'm talking about there. So when I do create world here, uh, what I need to do is first create one of these world generators. Um, who knows how that's gonna happen. Uh, then I'm gonna create uh, the orphanage here and I guess I'll get back a gen orphanage. Uh, I'll create an orphanage. Then what I need to do is actually have it do a layout to place where all these things, you know, would be. Uh, and then I need to do a, a world generate that would uh, actually take all the semantic information and produce the world mode uh, result from there. Now, I don't really know that that needs to take the world mode. It could be that you can just take the world... Uh, Yeah, that, that may not need the world mode. It may be that that just, just does world. Uh, so I will say, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll pass the world for now. If it turns out that we need the world mode later, we can fix that. 
Uh, and that's fine. Uh, I don't know that we really need the transient state, to be honest. I don't think I'm going to use it. We'll see why in a second. But um, But I think that's it. So what you can see now is, again, I did exactly what I uh, set out to do. I wanted a way to figure out where my API should sort of begin. Um, and this seems pretty logical to me. This gives me all of the stuff that I wanted. I can specify what kinds of rooms I want to be involved. I can have a place where I can talk about things that need to be in them. Uh, and then I can uh, say how there should be linked up so that it will make a plausible version of that thing, right? Now in the future, I'm going to need to expand these. I can, you know, I can already guess that this would have to have constraints about directionality. Like maybe I always want the hero bedroom to be connected on the south side of the orphanage, and I always want the forest path to be connected on the north side of the orphanage, or things like that. Um, but you know, those are things that I can add over time, and there's a clear place where I would do them because I have every logical thing that I wanted to talk about is being talked about. There's the specifications for rooms, there's the rooms themselves, there's the connectivity between rooms, and that's basically what I wanted so far in the system, and there it is. So what I should be able to do now is I should be able to start building this out and actually do exactly that. Uh, implement those APIs and make them work. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with that. Um, and you'll see as we go, uh, yeah, basically the, the main thing here, like this stuff is pretty logical. The main thing that probably we'll have to get expanded at first is the specs. Uh, things like how big room should be, generally speaking, like what the flexibility is on that. Uh, and and uh, just some basic parameters will have to be specified pretty early on, I think. Um, because if we don't specify those, uh, we won't have a lot of understanding in the generator of how it should start placing things. So that part will have to be expanded sooner. The other stuff can be expanded later, like what actually gets put inside rooms and all that it needs its own sort of rich system of, of specification that will go in here. Uh, and that stuff I just don't care about at the moment, right? Um, that stuff that we'll sort of start to take on a little bit later as a secondary system that's sort of it's 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 you want to look at this sort of as a as a meta a, a multi-stage process get the layout of rooms first and then f find details of the rooms second uh, so that you can kind of uh, tackle the problem uh in in two stages so let's go ahead and talk about the types that we we said we had uh we know that we have a uh, world generator uh, we know that we have a gen room spec. We know that we have a gen room. Uh, we know that we have a gen connection. Now, we didn't talk about it explicitly, but presumably that's what connect would return. Um, we just never need to talk about it at all so far. So we know that we have one. We just don't need to actually expose it to the users yet uh, of the generator, but we know it's there. So I'm going to put it in there because it's clear that it's there. Um, and that's what we've got. Furthermore, we know uh, that we've got a certain set of routines here, right? Uh, and what we can sort of see is this will probably move out to, you know, we've got, we've got two halves of the system. There's an API for building a world, and then there's actually like the game logic of what world gets built. And those are two separate things. So eventually we're looking towards, right, pulling out like create orphanage will not live in the world generator for long once we get a significant amount of that world generation stuff um, together we will make a hard split of stuff that does the world generation work and stuff that lays out the specification for what world should be generated and those will not be the same right so uh, that's where my eye is at at the moment just so you can understand mentally, you know, sort of what I'm talking about as I go forward. Uh, so we now know that we also, in addition to these things, we've got a bunch of code uh, that we've sort of said has to be there, right? Um, we know we've got this uh, thing that generates a, a spec. Uh, we know we've got a thing that generates a room. 
uh, or creates the semantic idea of a room to, to generate, right? We know we have to get the world generator somehow. We know we have to have a layout uh, call that places uh, worlds and whatever. We need a thing that actually generates everything and then we need a way to clean it all up, right? And just say we're done. All right, um, so here in my, uh, we've got this sort of gen spec thing that takes the world generator and that's just something that produces a spec. Uh, we've got the gen room call there. There's the mix connection. I'm not going to use from and to because uh, in our world, we don't really have one way connections. Um, we may add something like a one way connection in the future, which would be like a teleport or something that only goes one direction. But that's not the same thing as we're talking about here. When we're talking about connecting here, we're talking about the geographic layout of the rooms. And that is only mutual. There's no way to have room A abut room B, but not have room B abut room A. They're abutting or they're not, right? So connect is about the spatial relationship of the rooms, connect them physically, not about the topological connection in a gameplay sense, which is irrelevant to this part of the code. This code is talking about where to put the rooms. It doesn't need to know whether the player can get between them or not. In fact, we could have people calling connect with a parameter later on that says, don't actually make a door. I just want these two things next to each other, but they, you shouldn't be able to go through them, right? Because that is something you may want to do. For example, let's say a room was on top of another room, but you don't want a stairwell. You just want to be able to look down into it. That's like part of the gameplay, who knows? That's an example of when I would want to say, connect these two rooms, one on top of the other, spatially, but don't have a way for the player to actually get between them, right? So again, connect in this case is talking about the physical connection between the rooms, not the actual semantic connection can the player get there. And that's an important distinction for us to understand uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, So we don't know yet what that takes. All right, uh, so now we have sort of all of the uh, all of the sort of sh the husk the stubs uh, of what we actually need to do here uh, and so let's start by implementing the basic stuff that we can implement right um, so when we go ahead and start doing this stuff we kind of know that we're just going to be creating these uh, arbitrary stuff that these these uh, yeah we, we're just creating this stuff here and fill in junk out. So what I wanna do is I want to have a, a good way to allocate this stuff. And if you remember, um, where's our arena stuff here? Uh, meow, 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 meow. Uh, memory. Uh, this is really good advice, by the way. So I assume hmm. 
But this is where not having worked with this code in a long time makes it tough because I don't remember what we had implemented yet. So we have here allocation flags and it looks like to me So, okay, great. So it looks like we've already finished this part. So if you look here and you can see th this, um, you can see this code just grows the arena anytime it needs to. So basically we can just make one of these and go to town. Uh, so I think we're basically good to go. So here's all I want to do. Um, I'm going to let this thing for now uh, and possibly for always. One of the things that's generally true uh, these days is, especially lately, uh, this was not really true when we started Handmade Hero. It's starting to be kind of true now. Um, is the amount of memory in machines is so much larger than I would ever have expected it to be <laughs> um, relative to what we create. It's kind of nuts. Um, it's a little bit weird. Uh, so I'm not sure how much we care about this stuff or not. But um, in the future, we may want to hard bound the world generation size. At the moment, any platform we're gonna run this on is more than capable of giving us all the memory that we need to do so. So I'm just gonna let it take as much as it wants for the time being. Uh, we'll see eventually if I need to walk that back for some very constrained platforms. I'm not sure what the most constrained platform would be, maybe a Raspberry Pi. Um, but even like phones, nowadays have like infinite memory. It's weird. I mean, not for the crazy stuff that people seem to expect now in, you know, like a Unity game or something. But like if you, for a hand coded game, the amount of memory they give you is just absolutely nuts. It used to be that the iPhones were not so much, uh, but they're starting to get kind of absurd in terms of how much memory they have. Um, it's really bizarre, but More power to them if those hardware manufacturers can keep putting it in there. And I guess they're gonna have to. You can't even run a web browser with like out multiple gigabytes these days, right? It's like, I just want to load the front page of CNN.com. It's like, oh, that'll be half a gigabyte of memory, I guess, uh, like whatever. Anyway, um, so I'm gonna let this thing grow at the moment. Uh, and so I'm gonna use the bootstrap push size uh, thing that we wrote here to just create one of these world generators. Um, and so what I'm gonna do here is just say, okay, uh, when you go to start uh, creating a world, uh, I'm gonna say I've got a world, uh, the world gen here. Uh, and if I remember correctly, sort of the way we did this is you can say the type that you wanted and the member in it that's going to be the arena. Um, so the arena is just gonna be right, uh, or I'll just call it memory, right? So inside a world generator, uh, I have a memory arena and that memory arena is called memory, unsurprisingly. Uh, and so this will just create us one of these world generators that has its own arena and off it goes. And then we'll just create all of the stuff that we want for it will just be in there and then we'll just discard it when we're done and be done with it. Um, so I think we had a, a Way to do that here. Oops. Uh, so in here, we sort of have, uh, there is one nastiness. Uh, we never fixed this. In fact, I think we have a bug uh, logged against this actually. Uh, 
Don't we? Do we? I need to log into GitHub on the main Handmade Hero machine. I'm, I'm not. I'm quite sure I'm not, in fact. Um, but I have it on the other machine here logged in. Uh, let me see. Yes. Uh, bug and clear memory arena. Uh, and what happens there, uh, this was reported by uh, Busy Beaver. And thank you for reporting this. It's true. Uh, I will log that as resolved today, presumably. Um, we'll see. But what you can see here is this was written before we used the bootstrap stuff, which allocates the arena inside the arena itself. And so what happens is when you do free last block and you do this to allocate memory, on exit from the routine, you come back to clear, you check this, and this is now an invalid pointer, right? So what we actually need to do there in order to make this be safe is we want to check this uh, as a prophylactic first to see whether or not we, uh, we are done. If this is the last block, because if it is the last block, then we want to break always. So we can actually leave the loop mostly the same, uh, but what we do want to do here is like you can see where we do this arena preve thing, uh, we can say, uh, you know, something like exit or this is last block. Um, and I'll put a note here. So what we want to do here is say, look, if this was the last block, so you know, if the um, uh, if the uh, the arena current block, ha the one before it, uh, which we're about to say is a new current block, uh, if that is not valid, so if there's if it's a null, right? Or I, you know, what I could do it this way, if the if the one that we will be moving to is zero, then this is the last block. Uh, and so I'd say, uh, if this is the last block, break, right? Um, probably not the cleanest way to write that loop, but that'd work. And like I said, that kind of has to be in there in order to make sure that the clear actually works because uh, otherwise we could free the arena and then look at the arena, which is obviously a bug. Um, the other way to write this, I guess, would be to just make this a for loop and do an if for it doesn't matter. All right. Uh, so anyway, uh, I'm going to call clear on this, and that'll be the end of it. That'll free all the memory that we use. So then we don't really have to track the memory at all, um, and we don't care. We can just do whatever we want. Uh, so then for each of these, uh, I can do... Uh, a push struct on them and just get them. Oops. Uh, and I probably want these to be zeroed uh, when we're doing it as well. Uh, I don't remember whether we said that's the default. It is. Um, so it'll just get cleared to zero always. So if you look at what we've got here, um, we have now implemented a stub version uh, of basically everything. Uh, and uh, if I go in and now actually call this, which I don't think I'm actually doing. Uh, so inside create world here, for example, uh, I'll actually call this now.
I'm going to switch to debug mode. Uh, and that's a good stopping place too for today, so that's great. Tomorrow we can basically start typing that in. How come I did not hit my breakpoint? What was taking so long? Do you see how long that took? What? How are we? Oh, so the generate lighting pattern takes forever in uh, debug mode. I'll have to fix that. Look at how long that takes. Um, but anyway, uh, here we go. So, you know, that's not even the one I wanted. Got too many things called create world. Uh, so I just want to walk through this here. So when we do begin world gen, uh, we do a bootstrap, right? And so then what we get back is uh, one of these guys that just has uh, the memory uh, arena built inside it. So then when we start doing stuff, we just can. Uh, so then we come through here, we'd like to do a gen spec, right? We just push one of those on. Um, off we go, right? And so this just basically just generates all that uh, memory, fills it up, and good to go. Uh, we then call these sub functions that don't do anything yet, uh, and then we end the world gen, which does the clear, right? And now the clear, there should only be like one block, I think, right? Uh, the, yeah, because we didn't use very much memory, right? So then there's a previous uh, that's, that's set to zero, so this should be set to one because it is the last block. So when it frees it, it'll see that it's the last block and leave, uh, so that bug's gone and off we go. Um, so that's all good. Uh, you know, um, we're, we're all happy campers there. Uh, and that's a good place to leave it for today. Um, let me go ahead and uh, close that bug out too. Uh, Today is what, 4.44. So I'll just say this should be fixed as of day 4.44. Uh, oops. And then I think we will go to the Q&A. Let's close and comment right there. And Q&A. There we go. Any thoughts on Mike Acton joining the Unity dev team? Um, I don't have a lot of thoughts on it other than it seems good uh, to me. Unity is used by a lot of people to make games now and it like the quality level seems pretty low on a lot of those games uh, in terms of the code quality. I don't know whether that's because Unity has low code quality or whether that's because, hey, the whole point of Unity is that inexperienced people in terms of programming can use it to make games. That's like the whole point of licensing an engine um, a lot of the times. I mean, sometimes the point is just to save yourself the work. But a lot of times it's because people who could not have made an engine can now license one and use it, and that's good. I don't know if maybe it's just because they don't really know what they're doing programming-wise, so it makes it appear like it's a lot more finicky and poor performance and all the other sorts of things i don't know right um but i do know that a lot of games i play that use unity have a lot of problems that really shouldn't be there and i don't know why that is but one of the problems may be that there needs to be more attention paid to how to make it be efficient given that you know that the people who are using it aren't necessarily expert programmers in fact a lot of times the whole point is that they aren't so it seems like having people who have a focus on sort of performance and code cleanliness 
in that sense, not overcomplicating things and making it be designed specifically to do good CPU level processing is a plus and hopefully will lead to good things. Because a lot of people make games in Unity, so we're gonna get games made in Unity. There's no two ways about that. The better Unity is, the better those games will be, right? Because the more improvements you can make to Unity, the more those games will be improved by it, right? Same is true of the Unreal Engine. The better you make the Unreal Engine, the better the games are, because a lot of people use it, you know? Um, if the Unreal Engine had better networking code, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds wouldn't be such a pile, right? Like, I don't know, sorry uh, to, to, to be mean about it, but the networking code in that game, well, the networking code in a lot of Unreal Engine games is just really bad. Uh, and, you know, that's like, hey, if uh, they make good, significant technological advances, in some of those things, then all those games get better and that's better for everybody, right? So it does seem good. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, can he make meaningful improvements to it? He's only one guy, you know, it's not like he gets to go there and change the whole thing or whatever. So I don't know um, what will become of it, but it seems good. You know, it seems like it could have a positive, positive impact, right? Is the parentheses around the return value used for debugging or just a habit? Uh, just a habit. It, it doesn't do anything. Um, uh, so you're talking about this. Uh, if you remove those parentheses, nothing would change at all like any at all like anywhere uh i just always got used to reading it that way and i don't remember why um yeah i don't know i mean technically there is a thing that makes a difference here which is that if found task was a macro that included a semicolon this would make sure that you got an error um so so there is one safety reason why you might want to do that, but uh, I don't know that I've ever really relied on that to catch bugs. So I'm doing it out of habit. Uh, there, I guess, is a reason you might want to do it, but I wouldn't consider that reason particularly worthwhile. Because um, the compiler should... Most compilers will give you an unreachable code warning uh, in in a release in uh, uh, optimized builds. So chances are you would eventually find it anyway. A debug maybe a debug build wouldn't tell you because it didn't do dead code elimination or something. Um, but uh, but a release mode build almost certainly would find would realize that you had something after a hard return, and it would tell you. So I don't think you would. Yeah, I really don't think it's a, a much of an issue. Is it a good idea to use events? I, you got to give me more context than that. I mean, yeah, events are a tool, right? They're um, it's like asking, is it a good idea to use the cross product? I, for what, right? Like, I mean, I don't know. Um, so events uh, are useful for certain circumstances uh, and not useful in others. If you need to be able to serialize a set of things across multiple threads, events are very useful, um, or distribute things across multiple threads are very useful. If you need to break up a control flow pattern to avoid using a callback, events are very useful. Um, if you're just spamming in an event system for no reason and you could have just called a function, that's kind of dumb. So there's, you know, there's a lot of different, there, there's, there's a lot of different scenarios there, and I wouldn't say that you can just say events good, bad, right? You have to have some idea of like what, you know, what was the reason uh, and what are you trying to solve? Does a, an event make sense here, right? Are we gonna see the new art asset soon? Uh, today was exciting, I can't wait for World Gen, should be interesting. Um, I don't know, like we'll get, like everything else, I get to it when I get to it. Off topic, if you run out of other questions, in C, is there a way to make something similar to function overloading? I don't know. I'm sorry. 
I don't use straight C, so I don't keep up with the C spec much. Um, the C spec has changed considerably since I learned it. I mean, I learned it in the 80s, um, and the C spec has been revised heavily since then. So whether there's something you can do nowadays that's similar to function overloading, I don't know. I don't think so, uh, but there might be. But I'm the wrong one to ask because I really don't keep up with it enough. I read somewhere you can pound to find return and log all your returns that happen. Uh, sure. You can certainly do that. What do I think of Golang? I have never used Golang, so I, I don't know. Just as a side note on the NVIDIA fiasco you had, I found that in my case, I can get NSIGHT graphics to crash in the same way if I use raw input to get PS4 controller data. Really? As soon as I remove the call that registers raw input controllers, NSIGHT works. Any idea on why that could happen? Maybe NSIGHT is using something for intercepting user input. So I guess my question would be, does it matter what raw input controllers you register or not? If any re raw input registration causes it to happen, then I think you're onto something there. If it's only registration of the PS4 controller that caused it to crash, I might ask whether you're sure you don't have some other dependency further down the line based on the PS4 controller registration that might be causing it because it doesn't seem like they would crash on a specific HID registration, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, obviously they could, but it just seems unlikely. It seems less likely. I know you did a video on interpolation. Do you know of any good resources for cubic B splines? Uh, what do you want to know about cubic B splines? Um, you just want to kind of get better at understanding how B splines work or, uh, I mean, I guess I couldn't tell you off the top of my head that there's any particularly great B spline reference. Um, Uh, yeah, I don't really have anything off the top of my head, sorry. I, I mean, B-splines and, and Bezier curves, cu cubic B-splines and cubic Bezier curves are the same curve. Uh, a B-spline just has baked the parameters such that the tangents of, um, the tangent of sequential Bezier's line up. That's all. A B, a B spline is just pre-solving the equations so that instead of specifying two endpoints and two tangents, you just specify points, and each point is the tangent of the next po point. Right? Like you, you already say that this whole curve is going to be continuous, so every point implies the tangent for the next point, right? Or the previous point, however you want to look at that. Um. So I don't know of anything offhand, uh, but there's no other magic to it, right? It's not like a B-spline is a different type of curve. It's the same type of curve. It's just a Bezier curve that's had the tangents pre-baked because you want to be able to have as many arbitrary numbers of points. So instead of specifying uh, two endpoints and two tangents, and then for the next curve, making the two tangents force to be the same length and the same direction, um, you just pre-say that those are derived from the points themselves. I mean, that's, that's it. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I realize that doesn't help because if you want a full reference and, and to see how they work, you work them through and all that, obviously you need more than that uh, basic explanation that I just gave. But that is 
um, the first step to understanding them anyway, is just to realize that all of those curves are the same. Um, they're just different ways of specifying the inputs. So with a Bezier curve, you've taken a cubic and you said, I want to specify it by two endpoints or two tangents. With a B spline curve, you're saying, I want to take a series of points and construct Bezier curves out of essentially the lattice work of those curves going forwards. Um, and that's all it really is, you know? I shouldn't really say going forwards because there's actually two ways of constructing a B spline. Um, you can have forward looking knot or backwards looking knot. Um, again, this is like getting into the weeds and whatever, but if you imagine taking a series of points and you want to construct a Bezier out of them, well, let me just, it's been a while. So I apologize if I get something wrong here because I just, I worked with these a lot. Uh, in the old days, I don't work with them much today. Uh, so a Bezier curve, right, is going to take four points and it's going to draw a curve uh, between them by using these as the tangents and these as the endpoints, right? Uh, so you essentially have like a, an endpoint, an endpoint, and then two tangent points, right? Um, and there's your curve. You tweak where these are and you change the shape of the curve, but it always is gonna hit these two. You change where these are and that changes where the curve like starts and ends, right? So that's a Bezier curve. Uh, the problem with a Bezier curve, problem, I mean, it's not problem, but it's just an aspect of it, is you get one curve, right? Um, it's a cubic in this case, right? If it was a, Bezier curves can be arbitrary degree. And what that means is that they can have an arbitrary number of loops in them, right? So if I have a zeroth order Bezier, right? Uh, all of a sudden we're talking about, uh, curves. There's so much to talk about with curves. I, I should probably just stop, but, um, so, if you're if you're going to talk about uh, curve order, then essentially what you're talking about, um, it all gets just gets back to polynomials. Uh, you know from math class, right? Oh, let me use it, the standard notation here. You know from math class uh, that essentially uh, you've got different degrees of polynomial, right? So if I have a function and there's a t that I'm passing into the function, uh, then I can have a lot of different characteristics of an equation. If I want to have a zeroth order one, then it's just a constant. It's like f of t equals five. What does that mean? It means that t is actually irrelevant, right? It's not really a function of t. t doesn't appear. It's t to the zeroth power. It's five t to the zero and t to the zero is one. So it's just t anything equals five. It doesn't matter. I can pass in any number and I get back five, right? That's zeroth order, right? Uh, first order, I come in here and I say, all right, that's 5t plus, uh, let me use something else, 4t0 plus 5, sorry, 5t0. Same term here, but now we've added another one, and that's linear in t, right? t is to the first power. It means that as I increase t, I get a smooth, even line increase at this slope, you know, for this, this part of the parameter, right? So I went from something, and if I graph these, I get that, right? Just a line, constant line. Here I've got something that looks like that, right? Or it can go downward either way. Second order, now I've got f of t equals, you know, 3t squared, or maybe whatever you want, like uh, 7t squared plus 4t to the 1 plus 5t zero, right? And that's a parabola, right? It can be like that, it can be like that, something like this, right? And then I got finally got third order, which is the one we we're talking about here, which is cubic. These can keep going on, but you know, cubics were what people normally use, probably since what you were asking about. Um, 
So I've got 2t to the third plus 7t to the second plus 4 to the first plus 5 to 0, right, or whatever. Uh, and that's uh, a cubic curve, right? So that's something that looks uh, anything like this, right, et cetera, et cetera. I should write this a little bit differently, right? And each one of these can include a shape of the one below them, right? So if I just set these parameters, as I reduce the squared parameter, I get closer to a line. As I reduce the line parameter, I get closer to a constant, right? So a cubic, because a cubic can have a wiggle in it, right? A cubic can actually change direction uh, in and of itself, right? So a Bezier curve and all that garbage was just to explain to you like, oh, hey, if I set one tangent going this way and one tangent going that way, I would have a curve that looked like that. Right? But it can only have one bend in it. That's all it can have. So what you end up with is if you want to start to fit things that are more complicated, right? Let's say I want to be able to do a shape that looks like this. Well, you know, Bezier is not going to cut it. It's got too many, you know, no matter how imprecisely I fit this, I'm never even going to get remotely close. Even th that, you know, which is all I could do with a cubic, is just not going to work, right? I need a bend here and a bend here and a bend here, right? So I need more. And so the thing that you do with Bezier's, like if you're Adobe Illustrator or something like this, is you line them up. Oops. Uh, so here's my first Bezier and here's my second Bezier. And what I do is I lock the two tangents. So I make this and this be complementary to each other so that when the curve passes through this point, it is smooth, right? So I make this be the negative of this. So that's how you daisy chain Bezier's together to make a longer curve. You just do Bezier and then the next Bezier locks the two tangent handles. The, so basically, you know, if this is P0, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, what I say is, all right, the first Bezier is P0, P1, P2, P3. The next Bezier, instead of starting at P4, starts at P3. So I duplicate the endpoint. And then P4 is equal to P3 uh, plus whatever the negative is of P2 minus P, right? The, the, this, this, uh, this vector here, I set this point to be equal to that displacement, right? So my P4 you know, is going to be locked instead of it being whatever you want it to be. It's going to be locked uh, and say that P4 equals uh, P3 oops, minus, or we can do plus, doesn't matter which one we want to do. Uh, I want to go in this direction here, right? So I'm going to say uh, whatever P3 is minus uh, P2 there, right? Uh, did I do that right? What are all my parents here? So it's P4 equals P3 plus P2 minus P3 minus P2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so effectively, we just get 2P3 minus P2. That's our new point. And so P4 is now not free, right? So not only is there not another point to start the curve because we're saying they start and end at the same place, but we also prescribe P4. So there really is no P4, it's just a fan fantasy, right? Make sense? Great, okay. Uh, and furthermore, Adobe Illustrator does some other stuff. Like if you want to have a discontinuity here, so they meet up, but they don't have the same derivative, then you let P4 be specified. That's called a corner, right, uh, in, in their parlance, right? Bezier corner. And furthermore, you can also say that, well, I want the direction to be the same, but the length can change. And that's saying that the second derivative won't be discontinuous, right? Because remember, this is a cubic, you know? So it's got different derivatives, right? There's, uh, there's zeroth order discontinuous. And if it's zero or discontinuous, then we're not even lining up the points. That's one Bezier here, one Bezier here, and, the, and there's a gap, right? So it's discontinuous all the way up to its actual location. 
There's first order discontinuous. That's if you meet these two points, right? So I want these two points to join. So there's only, so it's always gonna meet, it's gonna be a continuous curve in terms of visually, but I don't care if this points in the same direction. So instead of looking like that, maybe it looks like that, right? So when I actually draw the curve, I get a hard bend there. These two parts are fully continuous, but this right here has a kink, right? Finally, there's second order discontinuous. I'm gonna write that. And that's the acceleration along the curve. So that means it will point in the same direction, but the rate of curvature will change at that point. So rather than looking smooth like that, it will look more like that. So it'll have, it'll have a kink, but the kink won't be visible at a, as a instantaneous direction change. It'll just start curving much more quickly. And then there's third order continuous, uh, third order discontinuous, which is uh, irrelevant for the purposes of cubic splines because there is no fourth term. So you can't be third order discontinuous because there isn't anything past there, right? Um, if that makes sense. Uh, so all of that is my way of trying to lay the groundwork for you to understand what a B-spline curve is. What a B-spline curve is, is solving, pre-solving for how you want to interpret your points such that a set of points passed in is continuous everywhere on all degrees. So there are no discontinuities at all. It is as if you did the thing I said here, where you locked the tangents, their direction and their length, so that they always flow perfectly third order continuous the whole way. And the way this works is it basically makes a Bezier, more or less, it's not exactly that way, but it basically makes a Bezier out of four points and starts the interpolation, but only goes a quarter of the way. So you can imagine it sort of starting to go like, well, uh, maybe I should say a third of the way. I don't know how you want to look at it. We start going like this, but as we get to here, we then change to interpreting the curve over the next four points, right? And then we use the next four points. And so rather than ever hitting a point, we always move the framework forwards. So the only point we ever hit is the first point or the last point, depending on whether you do trailing knot. You can do it the other way. You can say we start with four points behind us. There's two different ways to do it, right? Uh, and so a B-spline formulation is just that. It's moving the frame of reference before you ever get to one of the points. Uh, so you are always off of the framework the whole way. Does that help? I really like the look of the lighting you've implemented. Will the system be working with any light points? Uh, yes, the system right now does not require you to say what's a light and what's not. Um, it it's just takes all of the light in the scene and convex it. So you can have as many lights or as few lights as you want. It doesn't care. Uh, it's not like a normal 3D engine lighting where you have to say this is a light, this is not. It doesn't work that way. Um, it just basically says, look, everything's a light source and a receptacle and off we go. Long Boolean. So if I'm on the same page, if I wanted to make sure that two rooms never touch each other, we would still use connect plus passing a flag of some kind, or would you do something else? Um, I probably wouldn't quite implement it that way. It might be implemented that way internally, but I would probably have two different functions just so it's clear when you look at like repel or something, or I don't know, like don't connect, I'm not sure. But I don't think we need to say much about that because I don't know that we're gonna care. I don't know if we care if two rooms abut or not because uh, connect, uh, we'll say whether there's a door between them or not. As long as I don't say put a door here, there should be a wall anyway. Even if they happen to line up next to each other, it wouldn't actually put any way to get there. So I don't know that we'll necessarily care about keeping them farther away from each other, but we could. We can put in a repel thing that's like, keep these at least this far away from each other or something. Uh, 
Are there any plans to write tools to author rooms or will everything be done in code? Uh, everything will be done in code. It's a fully procedural game, so we won't be writing like an editor where you place stuff. Uh, although uh, someone's welcome to do that as an add-on if they want to, right? Like uh, you can, you've pretty much got everything you need for it, uh, right? Because you can just use the handmade hero source base to make something that displays the entities as you put them down, right? Um, so it's not, it, it wouldn't be that hard for you to add one if you really wanted to do so. Uh, all right, I'm going to wrap it up for today. All right. Thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along the series at home, you can always go to handmadehero.org and pre-order the game. It comes with a source code and I update it every time we finish coding here so that you can keep up to date with the series and try your own experiments. For example, if you wanted to start building a little world builder editor tool, since that's not something we're doing, you could certainly go uh, try doing that yourself and make your own little Handmade Hero worlds uh, to explore instead of the generated ones that are being generated. Uh, again, that's just handmadehero.org. That's all you need to do. Uh, we also have um, a bunch of resources you can go to there, like the episode guide and so on. Uh, I'll be back here tomorrow. So if you would like to finish doing the world gen uh, basic pass with me, where we're trying to just sort of get some rudimentary stuff in there, uh, we'll be doing that tomorrow, same time, same place. So I'd love to see you back here for that. Uh, until then, have fun coding on your own stuff, and I will see you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.